Now, tonight's sermon is not really going to be a complicated sermon. It's actually quite a basic topic. I think it's something that we all know. Um, I'm preaching on the sin of pride. So it's not really going to be anything new for you. It's more a reminder of, uh, for us as Christians, not to be proud, not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought, and also to increase our hatred for pride and for people that glory in pride. Right? Because God hates pride, we ought to hate pride as well. So the title of the sermon is The Sin of Pride. The Sin of Pride. And this really goes against what you're going to learn out in the world. Right? Because in the world, it's all about being proud. proud. It's all about lifting yourself up and exalting yourself. Why? Because nobody else is going to do it for you. Right? You better lift yourself up and, and think more highly of yourself than you ought because that, it's a very humanistic philosophy, isn't it? to try and bring yourself up and that's where you get a sense of self-worth and power and all that where no our sense of self-worth is in the lord jesus christ he will exalt us we just focus on doing the right thing and serving him so we're talking about the sin of pride tonight and the bible clearly states that uh, it says here in proverbs 21 4 there's a high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked look is sin so a high look and a proud heart, clearly in the Bible, is sin. Even Jesus, when talking about the sins that come out of a man's heart in Mark 7, he says, for from within, out of the heart of men, right? Now, this is not the goodness of man's heart. This is, he's talking now about the sinful man, the sinful flesh. Proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, look, pride, foolishness all these evil things come from within and defile the man so we are all capable of being proud it's something that the flesh is able to do and, and something that we have to know about and think about unless we be lifted up with pride now what is pride according to the bible what, what does it mean to be proud well i think there's a good definition in romans 12 uh, and I've cut out, there's so many verses I've got in this sermon, so hopefully I don't go too long, but there's just so many scriptures in the Bible about pride, right? Because God hates it so much. He has many different examples of how people exalt themselves. But in Romans 12, I think this is a good, a good definition for pride. It says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, look at this, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. So I think that's a, good, that's a good definition, I think, of pride, where people think of themselves as more than they really are. They think of themselves more highly than they ought to think. But to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So that's what it means to be proud, not to think of yourself more highly than he ought to think. Now, it also doesn't mean that you just degrade yourself as well, because that's sort of like a... Like a I don't know what they call it, like a pious um, spirituality where people just, they, they really want the focus on them, but they, they do the opposite. They just say, oh, I'm just terrible. They, and they, they talk themselves down, sometimes because they want people to talk about them. Right? So it's really a motive of the heart, isn't it? It's not, just, it's not just denigrating yourself and just talking yourself down. But at the same time, it's not just talking yourself up either. It's just thinking, it's just being real with you and, and seeing yourself as God sees us, knowing you know, that we're a sinner, knowing that we need Jesus to do things and we just don't think of ourselves more highly than we, when we ought to think. Right? So we're, we're real in how we think about ourselves. Now, there's a few examples. I'm just going to have two here from the scriptures. One is in Luke 14, which is the parable of the people that sit in the higher rooms rather than the lower rooms. So we'll read this together and we'll uh, have a few thoughts. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, so he's talking about these people here and how when they go places, they want to sit up in the upper rooms. When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honourable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, give this man place and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. And when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee, so bade is bid, right, is to ask, right? So when he's invited you, bade thee cometh, so bade is past tense, bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, friend, go up higher. Then thou shalt have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. 
For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So what is he saying here? He's saying when you're bidden to a wedding, if we were to use a, an analogy in today, when you go to a wedding, you know, the front seats of the wedding are normally for the family and for the friends. So let's say you're one of the lesser important guests, and you go and sit right at the front where, you know, the, the, the father and the, of the bride and the, and the mother of the bride sit. And he's saying here, if you go and do that, and somebody comes to you and says, excuse me, can you move a bit further back because this is for family and friends these are the more you know important guests so he's saying here when you exalt yourself by sitting at the front you're gonna have shame when you're told to go sit a bit further back at that wedding whereas what the mentality that we should have is we sit a bit further back right we humble ourselves and then when and somebody says hey why are you sitting back there come and sit at the front that's the better scenario to be in so you see how it's better to humble yourself and then somebody exalts you then to exalt yourself and then you've got shame when they humble you, right? When you lifted yourself up higher than you ought to. Now, when I read this parable, I think of how people lift themselves up to God, thinking of themselves more highly than they ought. And often when people lift themselves up in regards to uh, their relationship with God, you know, especially unbelievers do this, but believers do this too. Unbelievers will say things like, if God exists, why doesn't he show himself to me? Have you ever heard somebody say that? They'll say like, well, if God exists, why doesn't he just reveal himself to me and come show himself to me and prove to me that he exists? Now, that's the sort of proud attitude that unbelievers have because you've got to think, God doesn't owe you anything. You know, why does God need to make a personal visit just to you, just to prove that he exists, when he's already given you life, He's already created the world. He's already stepped into the creation as the Lord Jesus Christ and died on the cross, beaten, bruised, mocked, spat upon. And we have the audacity to say to God, why doesn't he just come and show himself to me? I mean, who do we think we are? Is that not surely the, the epitome of pride? To think that we are so high and lifted up that God, the God of the universe, owes us a personal visit? Of course not, right? So this is, this is what God hates. God hates this sort of proud attitude and unbelievers have this proud attitude. Believers sometimes have this attitude too, to a lesser degree, when they expect, you know, it's like when things aren't going according to plan and they just expect God, you know, to, to step in and just do their bidding. You know, we need to realize that when we come to God, when we pray to God, do you realize who you're speaking to? You know, do we realize who we're requesting things from? God is not like our Easter bunny, our Santa Claus, and it's just we, he's our genie in the bottle, right? Where we're just going, God, let's just do something for me now. No, no, we have to go to God with the right attitude, right? Like this is talking about, we need to humble ourselves. And then God looks at that and he's pleased with that as opposed to a prideful attitude. He may not want to answer our prayers, right? Because why, why should he if we have that sort of attitude? So people have to say things like, if God exists, why doesn't he show himself to me? Uh, you know, if God exists, why did he let this happen to me? And, and we need to realize we ought to go to God with the attitude that we, we don't deserve anything from him. Anything that he gives us is a blessing, you know. And, and God, you know, it's not that God is, and I'm not saying God is stingy with it, it either, and we know that. You know, God does do these things. But I'm just saying the, the attitude we ought to have when we go to the God that is omnipotent, omnipresent, that, that, is, that is the almighty, you know, like Jesus says, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end, that's who we go to and that's why it's it's such a blessing that jesus christ did what he did because we are able to go to that god right that's that's an unbelievable thing that we are able to go into the presence of that god and ask him of things directly do, do we even re, we do we even uh realize the privilege that we have I, I don't i think we often forget another example here is in uh the, the pharisee and the publican it says here in Luke 18, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. See, so pride will do that to you as well because you're thinking of yourself more highly than you are. It makes you hate people and despise people that ought not to be despised. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. So a Pharisee is one of the religious leaders, a publican is one of the tax collectors, right? Somebody that works for the ATO. Uh, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I always think it's funny that the Bible, when the Bible, uh, well, when Jesus is giving this parable, he's saying the Pharisee is there praying to himself. Why? Because he's not, he's not talking to God. 
right? He's just there talking to himself, just lifting himself up in the presence of others, pretending to pray to God, right? And we don't want to have that attitude with our prayers as well, right? Because sometimes when people get up and pray, and I'm not thinking of anybody here, but you've seen it before. Sometimes people get up and pray, and they're more like they're preaching a sermon, right? They're, like pre- pre- they're talking to people. But we've got to think, hey, when we pray, the idea is we're talking to God. You know, and that short should reflect in how we pray. Uh, it's not we're not getting up to preach when we pray. We're trying to talk to God. So we don't want to get up when we pray and just talk to ourselves. You know, we want to talk to the to the God of heaven. So he's saying um, he's not all these things. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. So he's talking about all these great things that he's doing. And the publican standing afar off, look at this, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. So look at the sort of attitude this publican has. That he's saying, he, he doesn't even think he's worthy to even look up at God. It reminds me of John the Baptist. When John the Baptist says, I'm not even worthy to untie Jesus' shoes. And Jesus comes to him to get baptized. I mean, just imagine like what John the Baptist is thinking. He's like, how can I baptize you? I'm not even worthy to untie your shoelace. And yet you come to me to get baptized? This is what this publican's like. He's like, oh man, I'm not, I'm not even worthy to look at God. And he just says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So again, it's a lesson in pride. And often pride is a reason why people don't get saved. Right? So this this sort of, there's a parallel here as well with salvation in the sense that if somebody is willing to humble themselves enough, they're the sort of people that get saved. Why? Because a proud person doesn't think they need God. Right? They think they're good enough. You know, the people that think that they can keep the law, that they can keep enough commandments, that they're going to get to God, God's going to look at their works and they're somehow going to measure up, that as well is the epitome of pride. Right? To think that you can stand in the presence of God and you think that you can stand there just when we, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. So you see how pride can stop people from getting saved. Why? Because they think of themselves more highly than they ought. They think of themselves as righteous in their own eyes, but they haven't submitted themselves, like the Bible says here, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, look at this, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So you see there's a, there's a, there's a humbling there because the opposite of pride is to humble yourself. So there's a humbling there when it comes to salvation because you're not trying to do your own righteousness, you're submitting yourself unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for everyone, uh, for righteousness to everyone that believe it. So that's how we're saved. We're saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you believe on somebody else, that's humbling yourself because you're saying, I'm not doing any of that. Right? This is what I tell people out soul winning. When you think of believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I say, when you thought how to get to heaven, you thought you had to be good enough. Right? That's you believing on yourself. But when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's when you stop trusting what you're doing and you submit yourself to the righteousness of Christ by believing on Him. Why? Because He's doing it all for you. But people that say, hey, you've got to do something, you've got to turn from your sins to be saved, or you've got to repent of your sins or commit your life to Jesus, give your life to Jesus, these are things that you do. Make Jesus the Lord of your life. I mean, this is not submitting yourself to the righteousness of Christ. This is you just trying to be righteous. That's why it's work salvation. It doesn't get people saved. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. So it's not that Christ is the end of the law, meaning you don't longer strive to keep the law. You know, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, right? But it's saying it's the end of the law for righteousness. Right? We don't get righteous by keeping law to everyone that believe it. Now, because pride is a sin, I, I think uh, my, my wife told me this from uh, one of Pastor Tim Coleman's sermons. I thought it was a really good point where he said, hey, we ought to change our vocabulary, right? Because if pride is a sin, why should I say I'm proud of this? I'm proud that I made this. I'm proud of my children. I'm proud. We should ought to change our vocabulary, right? Because if it's a sin to be proud of something, why would we use that vocabulary to say, hey, you know, Simon does something. I wouldn't say I'm very proud of him, I should say, I'm very pleased with my son. Right? And that's what we really mean when we talk about being proud of him. You're saying I'm very pleased. So if, if pride is a sin, why don't we cut that word out of our vocabulary in terms of talking about it positively 
and rather you know, talk about things you know, with the right terminology. It's the same with being jealous and envious. You know, jealous is getting a bad tinge because people think it's wrong to be jealous, right? To have a strong ownership of something. But generally when we think of people that are jealous, we, we, we actually, it's actually envy that they have. They're envious of somebody else they want or they're covetous. So we don't want to give jealousy a bad word when we know the Lord is jealous, right? Jealous is, I believe the Bible says jealous is his name, right? So God is very jealous of things that actually belong to him. Jealous is a righteous thing to be. So we want to use the right terminology. It's the same with Matthew 3.17. We don't see God saying, here, this is my beloved son that I'm very proud of, right? He says in lower voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I just, I just wanted to bring that in. Now, sin is a really bad, a really, uh, pride is a very bad sin. It's actually the sin that made uh, Satan sin. That, that was his major sin that he did was, was to be proud um, because he was one, if you didn't know, Satan was one of the covering cherubs. If you think about the Ark of the Covenant, there were two cherubs on either side of the, of the mercy seat covering the, the mercy seat of God. So, so Satan was one of those creatures. I don't believe he was an angel. I believe he was just a heavenly creature because I don't believe angels have wings. Angels, are, uh, they look like men. Satan was a heavenly creature with wings, a cherub that covered the mercy seat. So because he was right next to God, I mean, he was, he, he was as close to God as any creature could get, right? Being one of the, the heavenly creatures covering the mercy seat where God would actually dwell in heaven. Look what it says here in Isaiah 14. Thy pomp, so if you think about your, your pomp, if you're pompous, it's because you're proud, right? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee and the worms cover thee how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How, how art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said, look, this is the pride of Satan here. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. Look at what the focus is. Look how many times he says, I. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Look at this. I will be like the Most High. So a lot of people believe that, you know, because Satan was so close to God. Some people believe he was the light bearer of God. I don't know if I, I really believe that. But he was so close to God that he started to think he could be like God. Right? Because he didn't want to replace God. He didn't say, I will be the Most High. Right? Because he probably had enough sense to know that he wasn't God. But he started to think he could be like that. You know, I will be like the Most High. So when we are prideful, it's almost satanic in a sense, right? Because that, that's, how, that's how Satan is. Satan is somebody who's pride. He's lifted up, right? He's trying to be the God of this world. He's trying to be like God. But we know in the end, you know, he doesn't get his way, right? He's thrown into the lake of fire. And this is what this passage is talking about, right? When it says here, uh, uh, where did it go? I uh, brought it down. Oh, maybe I, maybe I didn't actually include it. I think it's the other verses where, where he's brought down to hell and people are like, you know, you become like one of us. You know, you, you are so powerful, so lifted up, and yet you've become like one of us. So pride was the major sin of Satan. Now, God hates pride. Right? So we talked about what the sin of pride is. It's lifting yourself up higher than you ought. It's the major sin of Satan. God hates pride. Proverbs 6, these six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Look at what, list, what, look at what is listed first. A proud look. Now, this is something I, I feel in the Asian culture, like in my culture, is really big. You know, because in Asian culture, I don't know if it's like this in other cultures, but it's all about how you look. It's all about how you, how you saving face is like the, I've heard so many times said in my, in my upbringing, right? Just saving face, you do everything. And the Bible says, like, this is what God hates. You know, a proud look. A lying tongue, other things. Hands that shed innocent blood. Heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies. Look at this. He that soweth discord among brethren. So, you know, a lot of people don't know that God hates things. You know, they just think God is all love. He's all, you know, bunnies and roses. You know, he's all soft and cuddly. No, no, God loves, but he also hates. There are things that God hates. Why? Because he loves. He loves righteousness so much that he hates sin so much. That's why heaven is such a beautiful place. 
perfect. But hell is just torment and fire and brimstone for all eternity. There's these extremes. Why? Because the more you love something, the more you hate something. And God hates things. And we ought to, if we're striving to be more like Jesus Christ, we need to grow not just in our love for the things that God loves, but in our hatred for the things that God hates. We should hate pride as well. When we see pride in ourselves, when, when we're teaching our kids, we shouldn't teach them philosophies that make them proud, that look to themselves. Rather, we need to point them to Jesus Christ so that they don't think of themselves, like I said, more highly than they ought. Look at this, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy. Right? So a Christian that says they don't hate anything, they're not walking in the fear of the Lord. Right? A Christian that says, I just don't hate anything, I don't hate anybody, you know, they just haven't thought it through, really, or they haven't read their Bible, right? A Proverbs 8.13 says, the fear of the Lord. If you fear the Lord and you walk in his ways, the Bible says you're going to hate evil, you're going to hate pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. Right? So there are things as Christians we ought to hate. We're not just people of love. We hate, why? Why? Because we love right if i love children i'm going to hate abortion right that's why people that don't hate anything it's because they don't love anything either right if you truly love things you are going to hate things as well now i'm just going to read through psalm 101 because we're talking about hating pr the, pr the proud and it's just interesting that when you know we live in a day of technology right well we've got televisions and things like that and we have hollywood movie stars and all and it was no different back then you know there's nothing new under the sun you know back then they had ungodly theater and all that sort of stuff as well i'm sure you know the only difference is now it's on a television screen you don't have to go to a theater and watch live actors now you're just going to a theater and watching something that's pre-recorded and special effects and all that sort of stuff I just think it's interesting as you read through Psalm 101, how fitting it is for people that just waste a lot of their time and energy and a lot of their devotion just watching television, right? Watching TV, watching the superstars on TV and whatnot. We'll just read through it and I'll give you a few thoughts. It says, I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. O when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. So it's just interesting there. It's, now it's about what happens in your home, right? What happens amongst the people you are responsible for. He says here, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Look at this. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Why do you have to be careful about what you put in front of your eyes, what you watch? Because it cleaves to you. He's saying, I don't want to watch it because I don't want it to cleave to me. And people that do watch a lot of Hollywood movies and a lot of TV that starts to cleave to them. They start to want to dress like the people they watch. They start to want to talk like the people they watch. They start to desire the things that they see these people desire and they think what's popular, they think is because they're, they're part of that ecosystem, they're part of that hypnosis, I guess you could say, where people are watching all these things, they're fed all these ideas and then it cleaves to them, right? Like he's saying here. That's why he doesn't want to set wicked things before his eyes. We need to be careful what we watch, right? A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Whoso privily or secretly slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. So if there's a wicked person. He says, I don't want anything to do with that person. Him, look at this, him that hath an high look and a proud heart will I not suffer. He's saying, I'm not even going to let that person be in my sight. Right? A high look and a proud heart. And when you think of height, the height of high look, and proud heart do you not get a picture of the hollywood superstars out there i mean that's all, all they're about you know and generally the people that you are watching and you're promoting you know they're god hating usually they're homosexual you know what i mean they, they they don't even love god at all they don't want anything to do with god and they're using their money against god right the money that you use to support their films on netflix or youtube or going to the movie theaters they then use that money to fund things like same-sex marriage gender ideology in schools and all these things and you are using the money that god gave you to support that when you spend your money on these things so he says mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me he that walketh in a perfect way he shall serve me he that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. Look at this. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. 
It's interesting that sometimes they call the television, right? The tell lie vision. You know, tell lie vision. And he's saying, here he that tell it lies. Like you watch the mainstream media sometimes and you watch the news and you watch all these programs and it's just feeding you a bunch of lies. And they're good at marketing. You know, they, they know how to keep people hooked, you know, watching their programs. I mean, sometimes I even find, my, like at work, you know, they play the TV in the, in the break room and sometimes I'm there heating up my lunch and then you're watching it and you're like, man, this is engaging. They just, they just keep you hooked, don't they? Just, you know, the next thing, and then it's like, you know, you want to know what's going to happen. And it's like, oh, it's an ad break. And it's like, oh, now you've got to watch all the ads to keep watching. This is why, this is why I don't have a TV in my house. You know, you've been to my house. Now, I, am I against, am I against the machine in terms of a monitor being in my house? No. Right? I'm not against the actual equipment because a, a, a TV is really just a monitor, right? And we've all got computers in our house. When I say I don't have a television in my house, I'm saying I don't have something that's hooked up to free to air, which I just have in the side and I just turn it on and just play whatever's on TV. There's a big difference between going on the internet, choosing what you want to watch, and then watching it, rather than having a TV in your house where you just turn on to channel seven, channel nine, and then you just have that playing in the background. I mean, this is, this is a terrible habit. And it's, it makes you waste a lot of time and you're just getting fed with just stuff that's just mainstream media and just all these lies that is telling you, just feeding that into your house. You're having no discernment at all about what you're watching on TV. So am I, am I saying it's a sin to have a TV in your house? No, but I think if you have a TV in your house, it's a lot easier to waste time just sitting in front of the TV. You know, I'm sure if a lot of us here, I don't know who has a TV in their house here and who doesn't, but I'm sure if you have a TV in your house, I'm sure you've found yourself many a times with it on and you're just vegging on the couch. Just, just there, right? Because that's what it's designed to do. And the Bible says here, you don't want to set any wicked thing because it's going to cleave to you. You don't realize the effect it's having on your heart until you start talking like them. So you start desiring the things that they desire. You're watching all that filth, all that conversation, all that God-hating conversation. You're watching all the, the women that are dressed wrong, you know, on there and you're just soaking that up, right? And, and YouTube and Facebook are, are becoming the same. You know, it'd be, like, it'd be like if you went onto YouTube and just went onto trending and they just left the autoplay on and then you just let all the trending stuff just, just, just watch, sitting there watching all that. That's no different when you have a TV in your house. That's pretty much what's happening. So we ought to hate these things, right? Because the Bible says that there are wicked people out there. They're making these sort of shows. They want to influence you. And then you're just letting them by just watching that stuff and letting that stuff flow into your house. Beware of these things. The Bible says we don't want this stuff to cleave to us. And if we're going to grow in our hatred for pride, we're going to grow in our hatred for the people that are proud and mocking God. We don't want to support those things. The Bible says in 1 John 2, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, so when we talk about worldliness, what is worldliness? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So when we think about these three things, the lust of, lust of the flesh, what is the lust of the flesh? It's the things that feel good to your body, right? The things that feel good. That's what the lust of the flesh is. And it says the lust of the eyes. What is the lust of the eyes? It's the things that, make, that, that in your mind feel good, right? But are sinful. That's what the lust of the, the, lust of the eyes is because you're seeing things and it's filling your mind and it's filling your heart. The one I want to think about here is the pride of life. Now, when I think about worldliness and the pride of life, the idea that I get is when, when, you, when you watch a lot of humanistic sort of people out there, and they talk in terms of, hey, you know, you just got to believe in yourself. You know, the, the humanistic philosophy of, you know, nobody's going to help you get there. You know, have you seen that? And those, and those videos are often very, very motivational. You know, when you watch those motivational videos where it's just like, you got to put it in and you can do everything. If you just believe in yourself, you have the power within yourself to make it happen. You know, you're like, oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, this is when you start lifting yourself up with pride because you think, yeah, it's just, it's just me. It's just how I think. It's just me doing everything. I'm capable of everything. Is this how God wants us to think when we're just proud about our own life, the pride of the life that we have rather than thinking about it in God's eyes? No. This is, this is the problem that people had in the Bible. In Deuteronomy 8, 
I'll just skip that for, for sake of time. But Deuteronomy 8, he says here, when, when they went into the promised land, he's saying, hey, after you eat, give thanks, right? Because unless you say in your heart, and thou say in thine heart, my power and mine hand had gotten me this wealth, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. Why? For it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he sware unto thy fathers, as it is this day. And you'll find this in all areas of your life. This humanistic philosophy of, hey, you just need to believe in yourself and go get that career. You know, just get, put the time in and you make that job work. Hey, you want to you wanna get fit? You just need to believe in yourself and just do this rather than depending on the strength of the Lord, which is truly what is actually happening, right? We become proud and think of ourselves more highly than we ought and think, hey, it's us that are doing all this. Look at what Jesus this is. This can happen in our spiritual life too. When it comes to spiritual things, sometimes if you're doing a lot of soul winning or you're getting a lot of people saved and you're doing things, you start to think, hey, look how great of a soul winner I am. Look at all the things that I'm doing. Now, is that partly true? Yes, in a sense that, yeah, you, you've got to go out and make things happen in the sense that you've got to go and obey the Lord and do these things. But is it just through your own power that people are getting saved? Of course not, right? The Bible says here, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Look at this. For without me, you can do nothing. So it's not just in our spiritual life, but even in our, in our everyday life. And we, we can't do anything apart from the Lord. Right? And we need to remember this when we think of ourselves more highly than we ought. Now, there are problems that pride can create. And we'll just go through these quickly. There are obviously problems that can be created in your life if you have too much pride. The Bible says here, the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. So what's one major problem with pride is that you forget about God. Right? When we're pride, proudful, we don't, we don't ask God to help us in things. We don't seek God. We don't seek God's blessing. Why? Because we're just doing it. We just think we can do it without it. And it's the same with salvation. Right? Obviously the wicked don't, they don't want anything to do with God because they can think they can save themselves. So that's one problem. One problem is we forget God. We forget that God is the reason why we are able to do anything and we have this mentality and, uh, and God will ultimately humble us and we'll see that a bit later on. Proverbs 13.10, look at this. Only by pride cometh contention. What is contention? That's strife and arguments. So people are having arguments with their friends, People are having arguments with their family. You're having arguments with your spouse. Strife and contention. Strife and contention in a church. Why? The Bible says, only by pride cometh contention. So I may not know all the ins and outs when people are having a dispute, but I do know one thing. Somebody's being proud. Right? Somebody's lifting themselves up more highly than they ought. And why does it cause contention? Because you think you should get your way. That's when people have contention, right? They want their way, and the other person wants their way, and if nobody's willing to give, right? Whereas, why are we thinking of ourselves in that way, that we deserve to have our way, as opposed to trying to serve the other person? That's why when I think of marriage, if people are trying to serve themselves, that's when you have conflict. But if both people have a mindset where they're trying to serve each other, right? They're esteeming each other better than themselves. You're not going to have conflict because you're not trying to get what you want, right? And that's why pride causes contention. You're trying to get what's best for the other person, and then there was nothing to conflict about. You should be fighting about who gets to serve the other person, right? Not, not fighting about who gets to be served. Proverbs 28, 25, He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. Right? So again, if you're proud, you cause strife. That's another problem if you're proud. What's another thing? Pride can cause you to be covetous. Look here in, a, what do I mean by covetous? Materialistic, right? Thinking that you, the world owes you um, entitlement or that you're thinking that God should just bless you abundantly just because uh, you're asking him for it. No, James 4 says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. So this is talking about people warring. You fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not. Why? Because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. 
So you see, pride can get you to have the wrong type of prayer life when you're praying and asking for God things just out of your own lusts. You just want things for yourself as opposed to praying that God would be glorified, praying that you can be a blessing to other people. If your prayer life is just about, oh God, please bless my business because I want to buy a bigger house or a bigger boat, and that's, that's all you're asking God for, that, that's the sort of pride, that's the sort of prayer that God is not going to answer. And he's not going to answer things just because you pray and ask for things to consume it upon your lust. Look, these are adulterers and adulteresses. Why? Because covetousness is likened to idolatry, which is a spiritual adultery. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? And look at this, this is how it's tied into pride, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. So you see how if you're proud, you have the wrong type of prayers, and God's going to resist those prayers. But if you humble yourself and have the right sort of prayers that are not led by pride and covetousness, then God will uh, hear those prayers. So it can cause a lot of problems, obviously, being covetous. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly, look at this, than to divide the spoil with the proud. So you see that there's a link there between people that are proud, thinking they're getting what they deserve in life, and they're the ones that are seeking riches and being covetous about it. Now, obviously, the Bible has a lot to say about you know, not seeking after riches. I'm just going to skip over these for sake of time, but there's a lot of problems with covetousness. And people that, you know, like the Bible says, they will be rich, meaning they, that's what they desire to have in their life, rather than desiring to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. They're the ones that pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Look at what it says here in Proverbs 23 for people that are covetous. When thou sittest to eat with a ruler... So he's saying, hey, if you happen to have friends or sit with people that have some influence, have some riches, he says, consider diligently what is before thee and put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite. Somebody asked me about this passage on YouTube and saying, oh, you know, is this literal? You know, saying put a knife to your throat, you know, when you sit with a ruler? No, no, because what it's teaching here is, is you're somebody that is covetous, given to appetite, and you get involved with these type of people, the Bible's saying it's actually better that you commit suicide than go down this road because you're going to go down a really dark path with the sort of people that you're hanging around. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful me. Look at this. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. See, see, when you're ceasing, when you're trying to labor to be rich, you're proud as well, in a sense, because you're not willing to humble yourself and follow what God has for you, right? Because God says, hey, serve me. You're going to have treasures in heaven. But somebody who's too proud to humble themselves to God, they're going to seek their own riches now rather than the riches that they'll lay up in heaven. Um, look at our pride. This is, this is the next one we're going on to. So pride can cause you to be a bad leader, but also a bad follower, right? Right? So it says here in 1 Timothy 3, these are the qualifications of a bishop. It says, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now, why would being a novice lift you up with pride? Because people that are new, people that don't know, don't have a lot of experience in life, they're often really worried about how they look, right? And how, and being lifted up, not, you know, and thinking they know more than they ought. See, thinking that they know more than they actually do. But for those of us that have been in the Christian life for a long time, we know that the more I learn about God, the more I don't know about God, the more I realize I don't. And obviously, I know more, obviously, than some other people. But the more you learn about God, it's just like when we were thinking about this old Trinity stuff, you know, it's like it, the, the rabbit hole just goes deeper than we think. You know, it's just, you, think you, you think you've got God figured out, but you, you realize, wait, I, I don't know all these things. And, and it's like that even with doctrine. You know, babes in Christ, they just think they've got everything figured out, right? No alcohol, church, Wednesday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, you know, go soul winning, you know, make sure my wife doesn't wear pants. You know, everything's just like black and white for them, right? And then when you start getting into the body, you realize, hey, some things are not as black and white as you think. There's these arguments, there's this argument, you know, and when, the more you learn about the faith, the more you realize 
hey, there's a lot of things I still don't know, even though I know more than most people. And it's the same, uh, you're not lifted up with pride because you don't think of yourself as so spiritual because the more you live the Christian life, the more you fall in the Christian life, right? And I'm sure those of us who have been Christians for a long time, you know, hey, it's not that easy to walk in the Spirit. And this is another reason why a leader shouldn't be a novice because novices often get proud and they despise, you know, we talked about the publican and the Pharisee, they despise younger Christians. They look at a younger Christian that's a bit more worldly, not as committed, and they despise those people. That's, that's an attribute of a novice Christian, right? Because a, because a more mature Christian will have some compassion because they'll realize, oh man, I know exactly what that feels like because even now, sometimes I fall as well. Right? So a novice is lifted up thinking he's better and knows more than he actually does, whereas somebody who's a bit more mature in the faith has a bit more compassion on people because they realize, hey, I remember what it's like. I still remember what it's like because, you know, it wasn't that long ago I was doing the same stuff, you know, and whatnot. So it humbles you when you're a bit more mature in the faith. You would think, right? People, you would think that people that are more mature would know these things. People that aren't mature, they haven't gone through all the ups and downs of Christianity to humble themselves to the point where they have compassion on those that are not as spiritual as them yet. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, what is them which are without? I don't think that is people outside necessarily of the church. I know there's two ways to sort of read this passage. I understand this as having a good rapport of those people that don't have a lot of possessions. Right? It's not just people that just hang. You know, sometimes you have preachers, they just want to hang with all those people that are successful and the people that have money. You know, the Bible says that the bishop or people that qualify to be a bishop, they also have to have a good rapport with people that aren't just rich. Right? So it's not just about how much people have. It's about actually establishing good relationships at church. Um, 1 Peter 5, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Look at this, neither as being lords over God's heritage. See, so a novice in the faith, when they, when they get into a position of power, they just want to boss everyone around. They like just being a lord over people and telling people what to do. The Bible says, no, 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 that's not the reason why you are somebody there that's taking the oversight. You're not there to be a lord over God's heritage. So I'm not here just to tell you guys what to do. What's my job? Being in samples to the flock, right? So an example in service, an example in how to live the Christian life. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, Right, so there's a mutual submission here. Why? Because I'm trying to serve the flock, submitting to God and submitting to you guys in the sense that I'm here to serve you guys, right? In terms to serve by serving in this church. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Look at this. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. So pride can affect how you're going to lead. It also affects how you follow, right? Because you're not submitting in one way or another. Another way pride can have a problem, can create a problem, is in your doctrine. It can create false doctrine. The Bible says here in 1 Timothy 6, it says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, so what are these wholesome words? Even to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Look at this. He is proud. So when people put what the Bible clearly teaches aside, and they just go with what they believe or they go with something else that's not the Bible, the Bible is calling that pride. Knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Now isn't it interesting that when you take the position of, hey, you know what, I'm going to study the Bible, I'm going to let the Holy Spirit speak to me, I'm going to listen to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, these wholesome words, you know what they often say to that? They say, oh, you think you're so proud that all you need is the Bible, you're just going to figure it out? But it's actually the opposite. The opposite, like, it, it's not proud to submit yourself to the Word of God and say, hey, whatever the Word of God teaches me through the Holy Spirit, that's what I'm going to believe. It's actually the opposite way around. If you don't consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, then you're proud, right? So if you go outside of the Bible and get your doctrine, 
and try and apply that to the scriptures, that's actually what the Bible is teaching is pride because you're not submitting yourself to the authority and standard of the word of God, but rather you're reading in from other sources what you think the, the word of God is teaching. Now, God, so I talked about problems that pride creates. God hates pride. You know, we should hate pride as well. Now, we need to, the last reminder I've got here is we need to humble ourselves because if we don't, you don't want God to humble you. Because right? we have examples of people being humbled in the Bible and, and you don't want that sort of thing to happen to you. But here's, here's an example from Daniel 4 with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, right? He was the world ruler at the time of the one world government that he was running. And he, he's walking about his kingdom, right? This says it came upon King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months. He walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. So he's walking about his palace. Look at what he says. He says, the king spake and said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? So you see how he's lifting himself up? Now, if you know the story of Nebuchadnezzar, he says, while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. Now, if you know the story of Nebuchadnezzar, he was actually, his, his sound mind was taken away and he was driven into the wilderness to be like a beast, just skipping down for sake of time, to be a beast. And he's just eating grass and oxen, his hair is growing long and his nails are growing long, just like an animal, right? This king that was the, ru the ruler of this one world empire. Can you imagine? That would be like Donald Trump, right? I guess people would see him as the, the ruler of the United States, one of the most powerful men in the world. It'd be like if he just, you know, he was humbled to the point where he just lost his mind. He was just a crazy person. He went out to live in the wilderness, just ate grass like, a, like an animal. He'd just be like, this is what God did to Nebuchadnezzar, right? And then he says here, at the same time, after this all happened, he says, at the same time, my reason returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. So now they're like, he's back, right? He's come back to his mind, so he's back in his kingdom. And then he says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, of whose works are truth and his ways judgment. Look at this. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Now I don't think that necessarily what Nebuchadnezzar went through will happen to us. You know, God necessarily might not make you lose your mind and you're going to go and then get your mind back. But my point here is, if you're proud and you don't think that's a problem and you continue to walk in pride, God may have to humble you in one way. So I think it's better if you humble yourself that God will exalt you rather than exalt yourself and then God has to do something like this to humble you and, and bring you down. When I think of Job 41, Leviathan. Leviathan was a fire-breathing dragon. I don't know if you guys know this, um, but I do believe that these creatures did exist. You know, I, and people think, oh, you know, that dragons are just, you know, banished to the ages of mythology. I don't think so. I think there's a lot of evidence out there that shows that people had seen dragons, and there are creatures in this world. I don't know if you know, but there are creatures in this world that can create like an explosion in their body. So the, the chemicals are there. It's, it's possible to happen. And it's just really interesting when you look at the Chinese zodiac. Have you ever thought about this? The Chinese zodiac has all these normal animals, mouse, goat, rat, you know, horse, and then one of them is a dragon. Now, why, why of all these 12 animals in the Chinese zodiac, are all of them real? 11 of them are real, but one of them is mythology. No, it's because the, the dragons are actually real creatures, right? We probably thought of them as dinosaurs. You know, we, would, we would probably call them dinosaurs when we see their bones. But look at what it says here in Job 41. It says, by his kneesings, his kneesings are the, 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 the breath that comes out of his nose, a light doth shine, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke, as out of a seething pot of cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. Now, I don't know all the chemistry that would be required you know, but I, I've heard as well that uh, people look at a Tyrannosaurus rex, for example, they look at the bones of this huge jaw, and there's all this empty space in there, right? And they think, well, is it possible that all this empty space in a Tyrannosaurus rex's head actually housed all the organs and whatnot to mix these chemicals together that could actually create a chemical reaction, and it would be like fire coming out of their mouth. I believe if you look up, what, where I read about this and heard about it was 
Um, there's a beetle called the bombardier beetle. Right? And, and you can go look it up yourself, but there's a, there's a beetle called the bombardier beetle. And inside the bombardier beetle, there are two sacs where it can create these chemicals, but it's only when these two chemicals combine, it actually shoots out a, an explosion. And that, that's, its, that's its, its defense mechanism. And, and, and the reason why I was watching that, I'm sort of going on a tangent now, but the reason why I was watching that, it was sort of showing that these animals can't evolve. And you can't evolve two chemicals that if they mix together, you just explode, right? Because <laughs> he's got one, as soon as he evolves the other, he just explodes. So somehow these evolved at the same time. So it was made to create this explosion. So they're just thinking, well, we see these sort of things in nature. I think about the, um, uh, those glow worms, right? How they can create these chemical reactions, they can create light. So there are chemicals that can create this sort of thing. So there's no reason why there can't be an animal that can create this sort of, uh, this fire out of his mouth if he had the organs and whatnot to, to produce these sort of chemicals. Well, look, it says here, upon earth there is none his like. So he's talking about Leviathan, right? This, this fire-breathing creature who is made without fear. He beholdeth all high things. Look at this. He is a king over all the children of pride. So God is saying the reason why he created this terrible creature, Leviathan, because people that are so valiant, so brave, they realize when they go up against Leviathan, Leviathan brings down that pride. It puts them in their place, right? Because this creature was so terrible, scales, you know, it's, it was in the water, it breathed fire. He says he's a, children, he's a king over all the children of pride. But when you go up a few verses in Job 41, look at what it says. It says, none is so fierce that dare stare him up. And look at what God says about himself. Who then is able to stand before me? That's a terrifying thought, right? We've already just gone through this chapter talking about this terrible creature. And then God says, that creature is the, ch the king over all the children of pride. And then God says, who can then stand before me? So that ought to humble you because you don't want to be humbled by this God, right? You'd rather abase yourself so that you are exalted by him. A couple of other scriptures, we'll, we'll just read through these really quickly. But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. So this is how the world works, right? People want to lord over other people. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. Look at this. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus is our ultimate example. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But in loneliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. That's what it means to humble yourself, that you think of others more highly rather than yourself more highly. Let, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, so Jesus was actually God in the flesh, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So if you think about God who became flesh, he was God in the flesh, yet he humbled himself and served others. He came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. That is the example that we are meant to follow. We're not meant to follow the example that we watch on TV, or that we watch in Hollywood, that it's all about you, you lifting yourself up, you serving yourself, you getting what you really deserve in life. That's what the world's going to do. You know, the Bible says here, it's not about you. It's about serving others. It's about humbling yourself and being obedient, even unto death, the Bible says, even the death of the cross. And look what happens to Jesus. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. So that day is coming one day when we will all bow before Jesus Christ and we will confess his name to the glory of God the Father. So God, Jesus obviously ex uh, humbled himself to the greatest degree. He gets the highest exaltation. But those of us who exalt, uh, humble ourselves, we will also be exalted. 1 Peter 5, 6, this is the last passage I've got. 
Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. So this was nothing new today. You know, I'm sure we all know that, the, that pride is a sin. But I wanted to just remind us today because what we, all, what we, just, we, we don't only want to grow in our humbleness, right? In terms of humbling ourselves, but we also want to grow in our hatred for pride and hating those that, that spit in the face of God and are proud and, and not, not uh, you know, indulging in those things. So if we struggle with pride, and all of us do, this is a reminder that we ought to humble ourselves because if we don't, God's going to humble us, right? But if you humble yourself, then God will exalt you in due time. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, there's just so much scripture here, Lord. Just had to, to go blow through it so quickly. But I just pray, Lord, that the scriptures that we've gone through today speak to the hearts of the people here, that we are reminded, Lord, to humble ourselves, not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. And, uh, Lord, that we ought to depend on you in everything. Lord, help us not to buy in to the philosophies of the world. You know, we do it all the time, Lord. You know, we're just believing things that... That, that we're told from the world and it just it motivates us, Lord, but it's because it's appealing to our flesh. Help us, Lord, to, to, to renew our mind and, Lord, to, 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 to humble ourselves and to be obedient to you, even unto death like Jesus did, even the death of the cross. So, Lord, thank you for that reminder today and um, we just pray that you give us the grace to do that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.